Greg is the Director of Analytical and Formulation Development at Fujifilm Dialsynth. And Greg's presentation, Biopharmaceutical Formulation, A Journey from Expression to Patience. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Bioprocess and National, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, what I'd like to talk today about is how we take um, traditional formulation development and try to extend it as a holistic activity across biopharmaceutical development. So to begin, I want to just introduce a little bit about Fujifilm Dyson Biotechnologies. Um, we are a contract manufacturing development organization of recombinant proteins and vaccines, and we're based in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, College Park, and Texas, College Station in Texas, and, and in the Billingham, UK. And um, so I head up the analytical and formulation development group, and, and this slide kind of just gives an overview of the, of the breadth of analytical solutions that we have to provide across a biopharmaceutical product. But what I would really want to emphasize today is the biophysical tools that we use during this life cycle as well. So and the title of my talk was Formulation Development from Expression to Patient. And, and what I'm trying to, to, to emphasize here is that formulation development shouldn't just be thought of as just drug substance or drug product development, but it's really a holistic journey from expression and, and, then, and then recovery of that protein through its purification and then its full finish and then ultimately its administration to a patient. And, and there's a list here of all the different steps that occur there, and, and what, what I want to emphasize is that we really need to understand the effect of the process and the handling of that protein and emphasizing how, how to maintain the stability of that protein during production. It goes without saying that biopharmaceutical product development is, is costly and it's risky. And so what we really want is an insurance policy around that production. And I'm talking about trying to keep that protein happy as it's going through its expression and then, and then, and then purification. And we can accomplish that through integrating pre-formulation and biophysical characterization at all stages of processing. So integrating pre-formulation and biophysical characterization enables us to look at the biophysical properties of that protein very early on, understand the, the conditions that it likes, understand the conditions that it doesn't like, what, what excipient ranges, what kind of salt concentrations is the protein going to be most stable in. And so we do initial stress testing at, to, to understand how that molecule is going to behave and then look at various conditions that downstream processing may want to use, the various buffers that downstream processing will use to ensure that that protein becomes a happy camper. And, and ultimately, we want a successful manufacturing campaign and ensuring that we've got increased stability, robustness, increasing column capacities, maximizing yields. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that as I go through today. So we tend to think of, of a protein structure as a, as a nice little crystal structure, you know, locked in space and time. And that really is not what's happening when that protein is in solution. It's really going through a lot of reversibility depending on the conditions and, 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 and concentrations that it's in. And so this slide illustrates the, the, various, the, the three stages that a protein will often go through from its denatured state to an intermediate partially folded state and then into its native state. And the behavior of those various stages is really dependent on the aqueous environment and what else is in that aqueous environment impacting the protein structure. So I've emphasized a couple of times that protein purification is a stress-inducing process. Um, going from recovery to capture to viral inactivation through column conditions that can be harsh on the protein and then post-column processing, concentration, you know, vialing, filling, putting it in the syringes. At all these stages, the protein is going to be susceptible to shear, agitation, maybe de degradation. And, and so what we want to be able to do is monitor what's happening to the protein as it's going through that purification process. So to do that, we have a fairly extensive biophysical toolbox, and this is a listing of the various instrumentation that we have at our disposal to look at, look at what is happening to this protein as it's being purified and processed. I'm going to give two examples today of differential scanning calorimetry and then isothermal chemical denaturation, and how these tools can really give us an understanding of what's happening to that protein as it's being purified. So the first example I'm going to take is differential scanning calorimetry applying to MAB processing, and then I'm going to come back and talk about um, refolding of a, of a microbial protein. So differential scanning calorimetry is one of the, the most valuable tools that we have in this biophysical toolbox. 
It's a quick and easy technique that allows us to look at the thermal stability as a function of the solution conditions. So what is occurring here in this example is that you're, you're slowly heating up the sample. You're looking to see when that sample starts to unfold and this transition, and what I can show. This transition here is when that protein is going to start to unfold. And then the temperature at which that occurs, depending on the conditions, the higher the temperature is generally indicating that that protein is more stable at that point in time. So we can use this to thoroughly and quickly look at various um, buffer conditions to see what is the most stable, most stable confirmation. So in the case study that I want to show you, this is a, a, typical, formula, a typical purification process for, for a MAB, starting with protein A capture, going through viral inactivation, across two-column chromatography, and then to final UFDF processing, which will often include concentration to a fairly high concentration these days. And as you can see, these little red lightning bolts across the process are points in time where that protein is going to be unhappy. It's going to, be, it's going to have potential instability. And so we want to design some, some, some characterization studies around those steps to get an understanding of what's happening to that molecule. And so what I want to show is what I've highlighted in orange here, just take you through the first part of a, of a, MAB, a MAB process where the protein is going to come off of a protein A at a fairly low pH, it's going to be held there for viral inactivation. Then it needs to be brought up to a pH that we can then effectively load it onto that first cation exchange column. So there's a lot happening to that protein as, uh, across, across those first two steps. And this kind of illustrates the, the general you know, approach that we do um, as, a, as a standard screening um, process to look at that step. So we start up here with the protein. Oh, what I can do. So you start up here, the protein is coming out of culture, it's, 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 it's harvested and it's generally going to be you know, at, at, at pH 7. It's then going to go through a low pH transition coming off the protein A and then it's going to be held there. And typically we might look at citrate or, or, or acetate, but that buffer is going to be at around 3.5. So it's going to go you know, a, couple of, a couple of pH range changes. And then we ultimately have to bring that up to pH 5 and, and then put it onto the, ca the cation exchange column. So we can use DSC to do all of this screening, and this is going to be shown on the next slide. Um, so over here on the, on the left-hand side is the, is the low pH transition. So the green, the green um, condition here is, is, the, is the load um, and, and looking at the DSC profile. So, so it's fairly stable. And what we want to look at in the, in the, in the, in the, the, blue, the blue trace is acetate buffer, the red trace is citrate buffer. And what we want to try to make, ensure is that the transition away from this green temperature, we want to minimize that range. So this is showing that acetate is the more favorable condition. The further we get away down the citrate here, we know that we're inducing conformational changes in the protein. So we can here we can quickly eliminate that citrate is not the buffer that we want to be, to be to doing that low pH transition into. And then on the right-hand side, what we're doing is then taking it back up to pH 5. In this case, the blue condition is, is where it started at pH 3.5, and then we're transitioning it up to 5. So what we want to do is look for the highest temperature here. The further we can push the blue higher is showing greater stability. So in this case, an acetate sodium phosphate condition is the is the, the condition that is going to maximize the, the 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 stability as we bring it up and load it onto the cation exchange column. So within you know, essentially a, a two three day experiment, we've done all of this screening, we've looked at all of these parameters, and we've essentially mapped out our pathway that, that for this particular map, this is the process that we should take. So it should it should go through through acetate and then being adjusted with with acetate pH uh, sodium phosphate. In, in this path. And so we can quickly and very effectively and, 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 and elegantly rule out what conditions are going to be favorable and what ones are not. So the, ca the second case study I want to take you through is, is, is refold process development. So refold is, is something that occurs for most microbial proteins that are expressed in E. coli, particularly as an inclusion bodies. Those inclusion bodies have to be solubilized and the protein has to be refolded. And, and, the, and, the, and the art of, of, of refold is, is really a black box. You know, we, we, we start with an inclusion body and we hope that we get some kind of purified protein that's correctly for, you know, folded coming out of the back end. 
and, and so what you're doing is, is, is taking the protein into very high concentrations of guanidine hydrochloride to, 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 um, to denature and solubilize the IBs and then, then adding back in a redox pair to fold the protein. And, and that process can be really you know, um, difficult and a lot of things can be happening to that protein and how it's folding. And what can end up happening end up happening is a lot of inactive misfolded and aggregated protein as impurities and then very little soluble fully fully folded protein so um, it's a real challenge um, and and this little cartoon is, is kind of showing up here um, you know a, a two domain protein that that's that's coming out of an inclusion body the the, the, the cysteines are, are are free cysteines and what we want to get to is down here is a is a, is a correctly folded domain protein. And what is in here is this really black box of, of, of solubilization, refold, redox reactions. And, and, and for a long time, we've really struggled on having a tool to how, how we can monitor that. Um, so how can we peer into this black box? So isothermal chemical denaturation is a new technique that has become available in the last year or so that has really allowed us to peer into this black box and it has really become a disruptive technology for us and how we can monitor refold processing. So what you're seeing here in this plot over here is taking a protein at very high guanidine concentrations and then stepwise dropping down the guanidine concentration. And at each stage of that guanidine concentration change, at an actual concentration of guanidine and a specific concentration of DTT, we can get an idea of the folding of that protein. And what is happening here is this is an ideal state is that you want to see this kind of three-state transition from your unfolded protein here into an intermediate where the domains are starting to fold and then, and then a final native conformation down here. And we do this by monitoring the fluorescence of the protein in the presence of guanidine and, um, and, um, and DTT. So the top box here is, is showing both solubilization and the refolding process. And I know it's kind of a complicated graph, but the take-home message here is that the top one is looking at solubilization, you're increasing your guanidine concentration, and you're getting that protein into solution. And then on the bottom is the refold, where you're, where you're driving it towards the refolded protein. And what, I'm, what we're looking at here is, is the, the protein in, in formulation buffer in green, and then in this case, when you're adding the DTT, and then on the bottom part where you're just in the solubilization buffer, and then you're starting to add the redox pair back in. And what we're really looking for is the conditions where those lines line up. If we can, if we can show that, that the, the folding and formulation buffer is, is occurring at the same with DTT, then we know that we're kind of optimizing both the, the solubilization and the, and the refold. And so these plots are all done with reference material. So the proof in the pudding here was to then take drug substance and do that study and follow it with solubilized IBs. And this was a really groundbreaking experiment for us because we were expecting with the, with the IBs, with all the other junk that's in there, the other host proteins in DNA, that that would really interfere and we wouldn't see the mirror of, of purified protein versus the IB. And what turned out to be is that we could really monitor what was happening in the IB and model it against the, the reference material. And, and so after doing, this is, this is one point of a, of, of, a, of a DOE looking at various DTT concentrations, looking at various refold concentrations, to optimizing what that transition should look like. And then when we were able to use this technology to optimize that transition, when we went back into process development and used our optimized conditions, we doubled the yield coming out of the refold process. So, you know, it, 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 you know, this was a tool that two years ago we, we wouldn't have been able to do anything. We wouldn't have known. We'd have, we'd have just guessed essentially at what conditions we use. Now we have a really elegant tool to be able to monitor what's happening here. And so, again, you know, really important activity that we can really now look to see what's happening in a refill process. And in this case, doubling the yield, which is really important to, to the overall you know, process. So I kind of want to wrap up with the last few minutes now talking in a, kind of about a new paradigm in, in, in formulation development. There are many ways to approach, it, approach formulation development, 
but as the pace and the complexity of, of development occurs, we need to be, we're getting pressured to do this faster and more efficiently. And so I want to kind of take you through a paradigm that we're investigating to make that formulation more efficient. So traditional formulation is a very stepwise, logical approach of, 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 of biophysical characterization, understanding, screening the protein with all those techniques, then, then starting to screen various buffers, various temperatures. And every time where there's a little red star, the only thing that matters there is time. We can't make it go any faster. We have to put it into various conditions at various temperatures and wait to see what happens. So this timeline is essentially a 9 to 12 month process. This is our little tortoise sneaking along. It's, it's great. It gets you to the finish line, but it takes a long time to get there. And in a competitive marketplace with your products, you need that to be faster. So the other option is to go fast. So how do we go fast? We can go fast particularly when we know what kinds of molecules we're looking at. And in this case, MABs, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of understanding now around MAB formulation. So we can build up an historical knowledge base and then start to look at various plug and play formulations and use predictive analytical biophysical tools to, to understand what's going to happen to that molecule and then couple that with high throughput techniques. All of those biophysical tools that I talked about all have order samplers on there now. The, the, the run times are much, much faster. We can screen 96 samples in a week. It used to be three or four a week. So we can go really fast now with our analytical techniques. So that's our, that's our hair racing along. We can do that in about three to six months. But what we really want is a middle ground. We want to combine the tortoise and the, tortoise and the hare together. We want to take the elegant approach of the slowed down looking at, at the various process steps and then combine it with this accelerated manner. So how can we meet that? How can we get there? So the examples I'm going to show you are, 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 are you know, taking, taking knowledge from experience. And, and both our internal knowledge and then the knowledge of, the, of, of antibodies in the marketplace. So there are about 25 approved MAB products on the market now. But in some respects, there's a lot of commonality around the formulation of those MABs. Um, the pH range is very narrow. It's only between 5.5 and 7.5. And there are essentially only five buffer types that all those 25 MABs are formulated in. There's not a lot, there's not a lot of novel formulations there. And one of the really interesting things is that when you look at the PIs of those 25 MABs, it doesn't predict what the final pH of the formulation should be. You'd, you'd think with a classical, pro, a classical protein, you'd look at the PI and you'd try to formulate around that pH. And that's not the case. And, and, and various people have tried to do um, a, you know, a toolbox formulation, a platform formulation, take the PI, stick it in this pH, and it rarely works. And then again, the um, our knowledge from experience is that the, um, the, the number of excipients that are in MAB formulations are really narrow as well. It's polysorbates, it's, it's, it's sugars, and it's amino acids. And there's only about six or seven there. And you can see here the, 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 the great majority of MABs are formulated in some combination of polysorbate and, 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 and salt. So how can we take all that knowledge and and create a, a faster, elegant formulation. And, and so here's a case study where we took two different MABs, one on our traditional linear trajectory, looking at, 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 at each, each condition in a, in a sequential manner, and that's MAB1. So then MAB2, what we did was essentially just screen through a DOE. We took our top three or four buffer conditions, we took our top three or four excipients, and, 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 and then the concentration. And so the, the, the MAB1 process takes about a year to go through that process. MAB2 takes about three months. So you're using the predictive and, 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 and knowledge from experience of what's in the marketplace for a MAB to really speed up that early phase MAB. So again, you know, the MAB1 formulation approach is, is comprehensive screening up front and then replicate buffer pH screenings, which takes about six weeks, then excipient screenings, and then an excipient DOE to finalize those concentrations. Then you do solubility studies, and then you just got to put it on stability, and you got to wait, and you got to see what happens. 
and, and typically you need to get to about three months of accelerated stability before you really can confidently say that's the right formulation. So MAB2, what we do is to essentially take that DOE and just the narrow approach of the known formulations, known excipients, and, and, and screen against that with a wider variety of analytical tools and then pre-select one or two top candidates, do concentration studies on those, and then put that onto accelerated stability for that 10 to 12 week period. And, and, then, hit, and, 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 then, and then look at the data. And in this case, one of the things that we became apparent is that we were really challenged with the concentration of this antibody. You know, there are a lot of antibody formulations now hitting 100, 200 mg per mil. That's not always the case. Some of them can become insoluble. And so we had to look at this one in this case. So once we started getting to about 40 mg per mil, we really started to see some opalescence. So how did that really fast approach work out? And it turns out that the results are really promising. So in this example, we have, we have um, 25 weeks of stability here. And we know that at, and, and both at a frozen temperature and at a liquid 2 to 8 temperature, using the, the refined DOE approach, we're showing that we can get stability up to six months at, at, at two to eight. And we continue to see a formulation that's clear and with little particulates. So by, by knowing what the historical knowledge is, we can really speed up now a MAP formulation. So just to kind of to summarize here, um, you know, we showed with two different antibodies, we can essentially get to the same formulation with a traditional and a, and a pseudo fast track pro pro um, process. And as more of these MABs start to, 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 to come into the marketplace, you know, we can build on that knowledge again. And the next challenge is going to start to see, you know, MABs started out at 10 to 20 mg per mil, now they're up to a couple of hundred mg per mil. And that, and that um, is really challenging in, in processing. We have to, you know, look at our UFDF systems and how are, we, how are we running that process step, how are we ensuring that we're capturing everything. That retentate now on a UFDF at a couple of hundred million per mil is grams of material that's sitting there. So we have to be really cautious about the conditions that we're using there when we're ensuring that we're not precipitating the protein during that process. So to kind of summarize the... Um, a biopharmaceutical protein, you know, goes through a different, a difficult journey. It's always going to be happy from the minute you start expressing it to the last time you put it in that vial. And so these biophysical tools are really essential in understanding what's happening there. And that's why we really emphasize to our clients that this is something fundamental that you want to be doing during process development. Um, but faster is not always better. You know, critical stability can only really come from excel from stability, and so you can't over that overlook that fact. You can do things quickly to come up with candidates, but the proof has to be that when you get to that final stability, is, 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 are your studies showing that your protein is is, is is developed a sound formulation? Okay. Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge some of the folks um, in, in North Carolina that, that worked on all this work, um, Catherine Bowers, Gathry Vasudevan, um, fill her up, and, and my colleagues back at FDBK and FDBU. And if you'd like to hear more, we're booths right behind us here if you want to come visit us. Thanks for your time.